everyone's happy, I am, hope you are. Uh, have a little seat back and uh, let's start the second half. Thank you. Sharps, a short story by Ian Richardson. As she often did at this point in the morning, Sarah gave a small mental nod of thanks to Errol Flynn. She unloaded the fridge and placed on the kitchen counter the essentials for her snacks. She held tight to the organisation of her morning. She always prepared enough supplies to get her through until 5pm, when the final musical farewell of Windows released her to go to the wine bar. In the order she would need them, the essential components were set out in two rows. On the top, a Ziploc bag and a lunchbox, and below that, Two slices of whole wheat bread, spreadable butter, ham, cheese on alternate days, a Mars bar, four oranges, and a syringe. The butter went on the bread, the ham on the butter, the sandwich in the bag. The bag went into one half of the lunchbox and the chocolate in the other, all secure in their place, all reassuringly right with the world. Then Sarah slid open the kitchen drawer and took out a flat bottle, unscrewed the top, and drew up a full measure into the syringe. It had been a stroke of pure luck that she'd read a biography of Errol Flynn just as she needed it. She strongly suspected that her colleagues had been gossiping. Back then, she'd been taking a thermos into work. However, her workmates had commented on the unique aroma. Julia and contracts had raised a quizzical and possibly disbelieving eyebrow at her explanation that she only drank a Himalayan brew of unique earthiness. <laughs> Sarah pushed the syringe's needle deep into the core of each orange and then worked her way around the segments, injecting as she went. With a little practice, she found she could manage a generous measure of vodka in each fruit. <laughs> By mid-morning, Sarah was two satsumas in, and down to pixel level as she smoothed the final adjustment to Beyonce's cleavage. <laughs> There were still two hours for lunch. She was starting to get annoyed with Beyonce. If the woman did a decent amount of exercise, then Sarah could have photoshopped the cover photo in half the time. Releasing the mouse, she chomped her Mars bar with aggrieved violence. Taking a break from Beyonce's breasts, the left one was proving especially problematic, she wandered through the office to the mail tray. This was purely an exercise in avoidance. No one got letters. The mail tray was merely a nostalgic monument to a bygone era, kept alive by the occasional arrival of junk mail. The paper flowed in perfect cycle, printer to distributor, to mailbox, to waste bin, to recycling, and then back to paper, all without the need for a single human being ever to read it. <laughs> However, there was, to her surprise, a real letter for her. Slitting the flap with her long red polished thumbnail, she took out the short note. Sarah, I've been where you are. Now is your chance to do, to do something while you still have a job and a home. The answer isn't AA 12 steps. This man can help. Take this card with you. No name. Sarah felt a tsunami of panic rise in her stomach. She read the small business card stapled to the corner. Dr. Chow Lee, Chi master and contra, ac contra acupuncturist. Free Bell Lane SE10. Forever free. Oh shit. Clearly some nosy Parker had cottoned on that she liked to drink. Management could be such Puritans. If they thought she was a liability while she was still on her probationary start, she'd be out faster than Usain Bolt. Oh God, what if they checked her last job? If they told them about that stupid incident, and she'd not even begun to clear the mortgage arrears yet. Shit, shit, shit. Bell Lane turned out to be a side street, so small it was barely an alcove. Instead of the usual Chinese medicine signs announcing miraculous assistance with baldness, infertility, and manpower, the windows of number three were tinted plain black, and a discreet plate by the doorbell said simply, Dr. Lee, forever free. This was stupid. Absurd. Just because some busybody at the office thought social drinking was a problem, there's no reason to jump. <laughs> social. 
Her treasonous mind sneered and flashed at an image of the vodka bottle by the bed. She rang the bell. Dr. Lee ushered her into a simple, unpretentious office and sat her on a hardback chair. He twisted the card she'd passed over between his short fingers and raised it to the side of his nose as if he would diagnose her problem through some arcane olfactory perception. I deal solely with issues of addiction and by referral only. So let us begin with that assumption. Sarah shook her head. Not in my case. I'm only here because of work. Dr. Lee smiled. You would be surprised how many people call on me who have no problem. Their wives, sons, friends, or indeed office, they all think there's a problem. But my clients so often have a clearer idea. I must be a very charismatic person, that so many strangers come here for no good reason. <laughs> what is this problem that someone else thinks you may have? <laughs> Cocaine seems to be in vogue again. I always think of it as such a wonderfully Victorian proclivity, like laudanum. The word alcohol refused to exit Sarah's mouth. I suppose a teetotaler would say I drink quite a lot. Lee nodded. A perennial. Alcohol, like the poor, is always with us. I think a single session with the needles should solve the immediate problem. Is this going to cost much? Sarah asked. The great pleasure of being retired is that I can choose my own interests. So I accept no payment. The results are their own reward. Lying on the table in her underwear, Sarah wished she'd worn more substantial pants. <laughs> or even told someone where she was going. <clears throat> Lee had shown a proper professional disinterest and seemed immersed in counting the needles in Chinese as he perforated her skin from scalp to ankle. I've never had acupuncture before. It doesn't hurt at all. It doesn't even tingle. Traditional acupuncture, done correctly, is occasionally painful. It is how one defines the depth of the needle. In contra-acupuncture, it is rarely the insertion of the needles that causes pain. It's a method rarely practiced in the West. That said, you may feel a sharp scratch. Fifty minutes later, <coughs> she was dressed again and ready to leave. So much for the mysteries of the Orient, she thought, later as she settled into the familiar spot in the bar. That little dry patch at the back of her tongue felt swollen with thirst that water wouldn't satisfy but strangely, Pinot Grigio would. <laughs> Live and learn. She took a deep, grateful swallow of the chilled wine and screamed. Fire flamed through her, setting muscle and bone burning. She twisted to her feet before falling forward onto the table, the glass smashing into a shower of jagged prisms. As she fell, she saw a rainbow of colour caught in the air. Rolling off the table onto the floor, she started beating at her arms. Not fire, knives. Red hot pokers. Needles, she thought, before being sucked into unconsciousness. And the last thought that went through her mind was, what the fuck? Except it wasn't her last thought at all. And in her time in the ambulance and the hospital, after they cleaned the urine and feces off her, and then after the doctors had cleared her of epilepsy and ran through their tick list with no results, and they sent her home in a cab, she had one very clear thought. What had that bastard Lee done? She leaned forward to the cab driver. Can you change the destination? Take me to Three Bell Lane instead. I need to see a doctor. In the office, Dr. Lee shrugged. This is the best way. East meets West. Chi meets Skinner. Whenever you drink, the results will be instant. Contra acupuncture, you only feel the needles when you give in to their desires. I assure you, I have never had a client go back to their addiction, and soon the very smell of alcohol will seem obnoxious to you. To be forever free is surely worth the price. And remember, it's all in your hands. If you never drink again, you will never experience that pain. Of course, that was only the beginning. If you persist, then the next time will be much more painful. Barely anyone in my experience tries more than twice. The results can really be quite regrettable. Sarah leaned forward. And I'll never want another drink again. 
No treatment is perfect, he said. The desire itself never goes away. But it's like any other loss or pain. One learns to live with it, after a fashion. Sarah opened her bag and took out her lunch things. We have something in common, she said, and took out her syringe. I've become rather skilled with needles in my own way. She drew up air into the empty hypodermic. I've never had to bother with safety. Orange is very resilient that way. I hear it's a rather painful death when the air bubble hits your heart. But I don't really know that. One can but hope. Now, you may feel a sharp scratch. <laughs> Some civilians dead. You're waiting for what I'm assuming here is the subject to get shot in the face, right? Can you not just tell us, is the old guy in or not? It is Monday, and despite the heat, Theo is wearing the herringbone suit. He also has on a white poplin shirt and an anonymous but possibly regimental tie with a thin green 45 degrees stripe on a broader red stripe on a darker green background. He has trimmed his beard, which is silver. Not long after Dee started, Theo took him aside and gave him the name of Taylor who had made this suit. Dee wrote it down but hadn't actually visited. Recently, D tried calling Theo OMT, short for Old Man Theo. Not to his face, obviously, but in the office when we were supposed to be working. It was okay in emails or texts, but when you said it aloud, even D had to admit that it wasn't that snappy and it hasn't stuck. Theo would be about the same age as the older man in my report, the man in the bank. Theo says, Allow Rada to report the incident in her own manner. He always says that. We won't know what's important and what isn't until she has finished. God is in the details. Dee knows this. We all know this. But Dee is still impatient. Can't we just take it from the point where the old deaf guy gets shot and dies and turns out to be someone we're interested in? Please, sis. I hate it when he calls me sis, especially at work. He knows this, of course, which is why he doesn't. <laughs> we have discussed this at home more than once. At work, I always tell him we should be professional. Dee generally says that's a joke on account of how he's the one trying to drag the place into the 21st century. The memory stick he has been fiddling with contains his position paper on calculating <coughs> lifetime value which, according to the written agenda Theo circulated at the start of the meeting, Dee will present when we're through with the reports. He must know that interrupting and calling me sis is not going to make me get through my report any more quickly. It never has. Theo nods, and I lift a new page up in front of my face and begin reading again. I saw the man who had fired his gun take his eyes for a moment off the older man who was still standing, who in fact was straightening up from where he had been bending down to look at me. I saw the gunman's eyes beneath the balaclava helmet. They were grey and looked clouded. The older man must have realised by now that something out of the ordinary and severely threatening to himself and other people was going on, but he did nothing other than to straighten up. He stood, apparently waiting for the man with the gun to turn back to him and resume his threats. It occurred to me then that perhaps the older man was neither deaf nor visually impaired and might not have been absorbed, in particular, in correctly punching in his personal identification number, <laughs> but was perhaps more of the absent-minded professor type, with fully working senses that were nonetheless overwhelmed in terms of neurological stimulation and the kind of messages capable of reaching and attracting the attention of his conscious mind, 
by the contemplation of some abstruse and potentially world-changing mathematical formula or theorem or whatnot. <laughs> and that was why he seemed not to have noticed what was going on around him and to get down on the floor like everybody else. But it then occurred to me that if that, the absent-minded professor thing, accounted for the older man's initial lack of awareness, or response at least, to what was going on and being said or shouted, it would not adequately explain why, when he turned around and could plainly see the man with a gun no more than six feet away from him, and could see the people around him, including me, lying, for the most part, face down on the floor, and must have heard the shot that had missed his face by no more than millimetres, and could, like the rest of us, hear the continuous, or rather, pullulating screams emanating from behind the partition wall through which the bullet had passed. Why, given all of that, he did nothing but stand and wait. It must have been obvious that he was caught up in a, in a robbery, or some kind of siege, or even terrorist situation. At this point I had not been able conclusively to dismiss the claim made by one of the men with guns that they were in fact policemen. Although none of them had actually shouted police, <laughs> or even armed police, <laughs> as their first action on centering an open <coughs> bank with guns in the way that I imagine, on the basis of watching a number of films and TV shows, that they would have done if they had in fact been policemen or at least would have been supposed to do by protocol and legally enforceable guidance. Although I'm pretty sure that in some of the films or TV shows I've seen, the failure of the police to shout police, or armed police, was the subject of much discussion <laughs> and dispute amongst the various characters, who often had different memories and interpretations of the events, not to mention differing motives, interests, and was in fact the principal plot point driving the drama. And it was likely that such dramas were based to some extent on reality and that such an omission might occur also in the excitement of real life events. It was therefore still possible that the older professorial man might have believed himself to be involved in a robbery or siege or terrorist situation in the process of being interrupted and thwarted by the forces of law and order. But even if this were the case, it still did not explain adequately why, when faced by a man in a balaclava helmet, and with a gun he was obviously prepared to fire, and who had told him to get down on the floor like everybody else, why the older man didn't, but stood there, apparently oblivious to the gravity of the situation. The only person in the public area of the bank without a gun still upright, waiting for the man who had fired his gun and missed him by millimetres to refocus his attention. Waiting, in fact, for all the world, like a professor who has asked his seminar students a fundamental question to which he, of course, knows the answer, or at least an answer, but has no intention of letting his students off the note by answering before at least one of them has worked it out for himself. <laughs> waiting, in other words, mildly, as if to see what would happen next. It occurred to me then that the theorem or formula or whatever might not have been important and world-changing, but rather otios and ultimately fruitless. And that the moment when the professor type guy was withdrawing cash, irritatingly slowly, at least to those waiting in the queue behind him, and ignoring the instructions of armed men in a frankly thoughtless way that might just get us all killed, was in fact the precise moment when he realised that the theorem he had been developing was not important and world changing <laughs> after all, but was actually odious and fruitless, and that he had wasted the last five years of his professional professorial type life and that he now faced ridicule and retirement, <laughs> having achieved nothing of substance since his initial prodigious breakthrough at the age of 20. <laughs> In the nihilistic mood this realisation had engendered, he might not care what happened to him, and might in some way even welcome the possibility of being shot and killed. 
but such despair did not seem to tally with the expression of mild interest and even curiosity that I had detected on the older man's features and which I felt was inconsistent with suicidal depression. I will defer to Alex on this point, but my initial assessment was that it was not possible both to wish seriously to be dead and to be curious about what the future might bring. <laughs> In my opinion. <laughs> year of 2014. Here's Mary Kirk's poem on Stony Hill. The wind blows here on Stony Hill, more bracing than a breeze. It heats my blood and I would lie with you here on Stony Hill. This Sunday afternoon, lie with you until dusk and beyond ease you of your Sunday best and the lace collar you are so fond. Breathe you in my Lizzie Beth, my Lizzie Beth. A black wind blows now on this unnamed hill. I lie with men and with them breathe, breathe in the fear of dawn and beyond. It comes and over we go we will not see another dusk, but I see you there on Stony Hill and breathe you in, my only Lizzie Beth, my Lizzie Beth, my Lizzie B, my Lizzie, my last breath. Pastors are not a foreign country. They do things differently there, by Graham Jameson. It's 1972 in Liverpool 8. I'm being shown round this boy's technical high school by the headmaster, Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans wears a tweed jacket, a tie, with little pictures of cannons on it, cavalry twill trousers, and shoes so shiny they look like they're made of polished basalt of the bollards they tie the ferries to at Pier Head. His ginger moustache bristles with fearsome erectile hairs. <laughs> we walk down tiled corridors, brown and shiny, with an olfactory base of jay's fluid and top notes of sweaty nylon shirts and lingering school dinners. Greenish light struggles through grimy windows. It's like being underwater. One of those degree types are you, he says with a hint of menace. Yes, indeed, I answer. Something useful, is it? Engineering? Sociology. Ah, communist are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that depends on what you mean. I mean, do I su to subscribe to the state of the capitalist model of the USSR, then I'd have to say no. But if you mean, let me stop you there, lad. Don't you get smart with me. I'm talking of smart. Smarten yourself up, will you? No jeans. This isn't the Wild West. A decent pair of trousers. Nice jacket. Tie. And while you're at it, get your hair cut. And have a shave. <laughs> nice to have a degree, you know. That, but you don't really need a degree to teach this lot. What you need is to be on top of things. I honed my skills in the army, where you had to be on top of things or it was curtains. Worst thing they ever did, abolishing national service. That's why, you boy! This last was a sort of Tourette's explosion. <laughs> Fell out so loudly that I jumped backwards. The source of his ire was a boy scuttling rapidly down the corridor who stopped dead like he'd been shot. Evans increased his stride a tad, went right up to the boy and bellowed in his ear, Do not 
Run in the corridors, boy. Is that clear? Yes, sir, the boy whispered. I can't hear you, boy. Speak up. Yes, sir. Yes, he stammered. We moved on past classrooms with boys sitting in wearisome rows. A teacher at the front writing in chalk on a blackboard and was stalking the columns. The place had a torpor of a dank Sunday afternoon. Evans marched ahead of me, morose, silent. But when we got to the woodwork and metal workshops, he became animated. Here, there was activity, light, purpose in spaces filled with well-ordered equipment. <coughs> this is what it's all about, he said. Learning a trade, a skill. What these lads need when they leave here is a job. We do our best to make sure they get one. They'll never be lawyers or doctors, but they'll have the self-respect that goes with work. He looked at me for a long moment and nodded. This was the essence of his school, the thing he really cared about. At the end of the tour, we stopped outside his office. The door was solid mahogany. His name embossed in gold lettering like old Weimar banknotes. At the side of the door was a panel with three vertical coloured lozenges of glass set into it. One red, one amber and one green. See these, he said. Yeah, they look like traffic lights. Precisely. If you need to speak to me, come to this door. If the red light is on, then don't. I repeat, do not bother to knock. If the amber light is on, wait for the green and then enter. Don't enter till the light is green. <laughs> clear? Yes, well, I think that's quite clear. But <laughs> when do I start and what? You start tomorrow. I'll be honest with you, son. I've no idea what sociology is. You'll be teaching the remedial class. <laughs> Keep them busy, and remember, you're their teacher, not their mate. <coughs> I see, but, but he'd opened his door and gone in. The red light was on. <laughs> Disastrously, I ignored his advice. My first few lessons ended in wild disorder. Every night I would go home and try and think of what to do the next day. As long as the boys didn't actually riot, attended morning prayers, and were seen to be doing PT, and had their slots in woodwork and metal workshops, I was left to get on with it. I would start the day by running round the yard, boys following me in long, <coughs> straggling line. We did traffic surveys, graphs of favourite music, I found an old bike. We took it apart and put it back together again. I got my Uncle Gilbert, who'd been a commando in the war, to come in and talk to them about his edited exploits. I even bought in an old prime stove and some ingredients. We cooked up what passed for a curry. It burnt, but we ate it because <coughs> we made it. When winter came, I took him up the hill to sketch the cathedral etched in snow. It was hard work. I was tired all the time, but it was fun. One particular day, I pushed all the chairs and desks to the side of the room. We were sitting on the floor in a circle when the door was flung open so violently that it wobbled on its hinges and a glass panel in it smashed. There stood a huge man, so tall his head had only about four inches clearance from the top of the door frame. He looked around, <coughs> he saw me, and he said, then he stepped over the boy in his way, crossed the circle, and swung an immense meaty fist at my face. Some sort of primal success <coughs> told me what was coming, and I kind of went with the punch, so although it hurt, and my glasses were bust, and my mouth was bleeding, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. There was pandemonium in the room. Boys in various states of Noisy shock and excitement. Then a boy I'd never seen before, out of breath and panting, came running in after him. 
No, Dad, he shouted. It's not him. That's not Watkins. <laughs> the man turned, puzzled. <coughs> you told me he wore glasses. <coughs> yeah, said the boy, but Watkins wears glasses too. <laughs> oh, you mean? He seemed to think carefully for a moment, then looked down at me and said, Sorry, pal. <laughs> they left in search of Watkins, a deputy head and a monstrous man much given to routine violence, who in all probability deserved a good smack for whatever outrage he perpetrated on the boy. Forewarned by the commotion, Watkins had locked himself in a stock cupboard. <laughs> you could hear my assailant banging on the door and shouting, Come out of here, you friggin' bastard! I told one of my lads to go and fetch the headmaster. He came back a few minutes later, alone. The banging and shouting was even louder. I didn't knock, sir, he yelled from above the bin. The red light was on. <laughs> <laughs> by Ray Stoltenkamp. <coughs> Arthur wants more children. He thinks I don't know, but of course, when it comes to the two of us, I know most things. I cannot give him what he wants. It's the one shadow between us. After Robert, there was another, a girl. She slipped from me like well-oiled jelly from a mould. Sometimes, when my thoughts dwell on her, my heart shrinks to the size of a razor. I am destined to have only one child, my bonny boy, and to him all my attention must go because he is a very special boy. I want so much to explain his gift to him, but fear the rejection I will see in his eyes. There is always a proper time, a proper place. And who and what he is, my Robert must see for himself. <coughs> if I wake with memories of his future, I always write them down. I try to track his life he will lead because I will not be there to see it. The colours and textures of the future are so metallic to the tongue. Sounds, flint edge, the saint, tainted and unwholesome. Will the future always be so hard and sharp and cold? It seems such a lonely existence. I can only hope I fill my boy with enough hope to live through that. Following one of these dreams of my boy's time to come, something of that future always clings to me. It fills my body with ice. Nothing I do seems to warm me, and my ever observant Robert, seeing the pallor of my skin and the way I wrap myself in shawls, makes me hot toddies with fresh ginger. <coughs> On these days I find it hard to hide my melancholy from him. Arthur barely notices. He is too focused on his own hidden sorrow. My husband buries his secret in the long surgery hours he keeps. I bear him no grudge. My own past is not without blemish. I find the photograph where it had slipped through the hole in the lining of his jacket pocket. As my thumb and forefinger made contact with the picture of a young woman, I heard her infectious Yorkshire laughter ring out. Her hair flew as she and Arthur chased a bright blue scarf down the hill near Sheffield. The strands of swirling tendrils clinging to her face accentuated her prettiness, and Arthur's eyes shone with all the love in the heart inside him. Of course my husband would love such a woman. I can only wonder why he chose me over her. Such a woman deserves his love. I try to be that woman, but it is not in my nature. I was born in a wooden caravan in Elder Grove. My dad assigned to the spirits of the trees to invest me with their healing wisdom. According to Dada, my mother did not make a single sound during my entire journey down the birth canal. She only whispered the name Rowena. 
as my dad has slashed the cord. Then her final breath whooshed from her and she was gone. Change by Richard Kitesley. If it doesn't change, will it still feel right? I suppose the light will still provide the sight where the point hits, curves and refracts into the night. I talk in vows only giants can utter. I dream in alleyways in heaven's gutter. I wallow in a sea of aspirations, channeling signals of ideas far above my station. Then I wait for the right line to emerge and shine, throwing celestial candescence on a glass of time. For it's not half empty or half full, but rather balanced on the lips and essence of a fool. I wake and smell solvent sounds from the ground around my bed, heinous crimes of scattered times where demons drill and fill a hole full of lead. To emancipate and take the hate, leaving everything but feelings of dread. Anxiety, you. Anxiety, me. Anxiety that I wear around my chest, providing shield and armour, ensuring no harm should come to what beats beneath my vest. I remember the rain as it slates down and curls around my bed. I remember your face as you look and say I am your best. I fold the vowels and take the nouns to alleviate the stress. If it doesn't change and it never feels right, then maybe I am losing sight. Now our numbered days take flight and what passes beyond is more than just night. from a forthcoming novel by A. L. Kennedy. Because lying in bed when awake was inadvisable, she'd come up here to see the dawn arriving. The council let the top park open even at night. The qualities of the, of the view it offered made constant access a must. People felt that that might have to nip round any time and check on the metropolis where it lay uncharacteristically prostrate at their feet. And wasn't it flat, the city? when you saw it like this, so plainly founded on a tidal basin rooted in mud. Strangers would remark to strangers about that. Inhabitants of the hill didn't need to. They were used to it. They could stroll along and hope for the startle of a good London sunset, the blood and the glitter of that splashing on banks of distant windows, making dreams in the sky, or the roll of storms or firework displays, or the tall afternoons where the blues of summer boiled and glared like the flag of some extraordinary flawless nation. Even on an average day, the city needed watching. You shouldn't turn your back on it, because it was a sly old thing. She wanted a sunrise, or rather she wanted to be out, and it had been early and she had no choice about what she was going to get. At dawn, the sunrise is reliably what will, will arrive. You can be calm about that. No fear of disappointments. You're all right. She'd cut in and taken the broad path, safe between distantly dozing trees, no shadows to hide any bother. A woman by yourself, you didn't want to feel constantly threatened, but you'd no call to be daft about things either. You don't like to put yourself at risk. Well, do you? No, you don't. You shouldn't. At risk is no way to be. Then she'd gone round past the silent tennis court and headed with fair confidence, even in the dimness, because... She was here a lot, headed over the oily feeling grass to the absolute highest point on the slope. Foxes had been singing, screaming somewhere close. It was traditional to hate foxes, but she wasn't sure of why. She guessed it was a habit to do with guilt. They always sounded injured, if not tormented, and that could get you thinking about harms you'd done to others in your past. The foxes perhaps acted like a form of haunting by offering reminders of sin, and that was never popular. <laughs> or else, there was no logic to it. The free-form loathing. 
She enjoyed the warm din of them, the bloody and furry and white-toothed sound. It was intense, and she appreciated intensity. This was her choice, in the same way the hill was her choice. The open dark had given her a cliff-top feeling as soon as she came within sight of the big skyline. It provided the good illusion that she could step off from here and go kicking into space, swimming on and up. Below her opened and spread were dabs and chains of light, apparently hung in the vast nowhere. A beautiful confusion. It was easy to assume that London's walls and structures had proved superfluous, been let go, and that lives, pure lives, were burning in mid-air, floating as stacks of heat or colour, perhaps expressions of will. What might actually be supporting them, you couldn't tell. Then, during the course of an hour, the sun had indeed pressed in at the east, risen. Birds had woken and announced the fact, as had aeroplanes and buses. And the world had solidified and shut her back out. It was like a person. You meet someone at night and they won't be the same as if they will when you see them in the daytime. Under the still goldenish, powdery sky, buildings had become just buildings recognisably Victorian in the foreground, and repeating to form busy furrows, their pattern interrupted where bombs had fallen in the war. These explosive absences had then been filled with newer and uglier structures, or else parks. There were also areas simply left gapped. They registered past damage and then became tiny wildernesses, gaps forgotten cause. Rockets had hit in 44, V1s and V2s, Somewhere under the library, which wasn't council anymore, there'd been a shattered building and people in pieces. Dozens of human beings torn away from life in their lunch hour. It didn't show, but there was a memorial plaque if you noticed. But other human beings, not obviously in pieces, would generally walk past it and give it no thought. She was the type, though, to give it thought. She had an interest in damages, you might say. Damages in gaps. They could be both okay if you weren't stupid about them. Other places were more peaceable. She could pick out church spires and the cream-coloured Battersea chimneys of what had been the power station. Further off, thin trains pushed themselves to unseen destinations and details blurred. The far distance raised up shapes, or hints, or dreams of impossible coasts, lagoons and mountains. Mirages crept out from under the horizon. And somewhere, the crumpled shape of the Thames hunched along invisibly towards the coast. It wasn't a bad morning. She wasn't a morning person, but she could still like it. The parakeets were lively already and sleeking about, flaring to a halt and alighting. An alien green that never was here before, bouncing and headcocking in the dull trees. They were something from the mirage country beyond the rooftops. Initially, there'd only been a pair of them on the hill, but two was all it ever took. Think of Noah. One plus one equals more. They were teaching the magpies bad words. <laughs> By this point, almost seven o'clock, the standard architectural landmarks were on offer. The complicated metallic cylinder rising up near Vauxhall. The vast stab of glass of London Bridge. The turbines rearing uneasily over Elephanton Castle and the shape of the well-turned banister marking Fitzrovia. Each of the aids to navigation. And then, there was the toy box clutter of the city, a slapdash collection of unlikely forms, or the vaguely art deco confections of Canary Wharf, and dotted about the distant filaments of cranes that would lift more empty peculiarities into the undefended sky. These were the self-conscious monuments of confident organizations and prominent men Everyone of less significance was forced to look at them and reflect. Insignificant people gave them nicknames, purposely comparing this or that noble edifice to a pocket-sized object, a domestic item, a mobile phone, cheese grater, gherkin. If you couldn't make them go away or prevent new ones appearing, these proofs of concentrated power, silliness, silly wealth, then you could declare them ridiculous. It did no good but it could make you smile. You could try the same with other sections of reality sometimes. Sometimes the art of naming could subdue hostile territory for a while. She'd once visited a friend, more of a friend of a friend, in hospital. 
The room he had shared with two others had been high enough to peer across Chelsea. Some former inmate had left a meticulous drawing of the landscape, every roof in silhouette, marking across an elongated strip of card. The detail was obsessive. Each building was identified and given historical or scurrilous footnotes. As she had very little she could talk about to her friend's friend, she drifted into remarks about the unknown artist. She had said that someone must have spent week after week here being very ill, or very bored, or dying, or trying to keep useful by leaving a present behind. Her friend's friend had at the time been in the process of dying, and although he was taking it well. <laughs> it had been one of those days when her tact had failed her. Now, she wondered, if the Hill could find somebody who would make them all a similar long, thin chart to explain their outlook and keep them right. It would be most useful and appropriate. In summer, when residents loitered outside in the early hours to smoke, paced up on front paths and in gardens, leaned against doorways or sat on steps, then the place did have a hospital atmosphere. Slippers and nightgowns, quiet nods in passing, half-awake stares and faces still pillow-greased, soft. <coughs> they all needed a therapeutic map they could walk up and learn from, alter, perfect. Garnish with added footnotes as they wished. It would be a thing of power. Or they could go on as they were, half knowing, recognizing, deducing. Or they could make things up. She could do that. She was good at invention, often unhelpfully so. She could quickly feel definitive and point to over there and then announce, that is the listening post that records our affections. There is the confectioner's workshop devoted to making models of our souls. They do it with spun sugar. <laughs> souls never purchased, only taken as gifts or eaten. And that's the depository of regret. And there is the doorway to the furnace, guarded by a clever dog. She could reel off all sorts of nonsense like this. No worries over whether you want it or not. In bleak moods, she would just prefer that all the signature constructions with grand gestures were rechristened factually. The shiny wank. The spiny wank. The fat wank. The flat wank. The weird wank. The overlooked, the understrength, the pretty, the petty, the squint, and the sad wank. Why not be straightforward? <coughs> but she wasn't in a bleak mood today. In conversation, she might, it has been true, as I said, I will meet you under the spiny wank, right beside the station. <laughs> but she'd only meant it for fun. She might have even thought it, but kept quiet. She would have been able to remember that some people don't appreciate terms like wank, and so she would have waited and had a think, 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 checked to discover if she ought to skip the cheap laugh and be more standard issue instead. That way you wouldn't cause offence. Although you might discover later that non-habitual swearers were up for it on some occasions and pleased by bad words from others when the time was right. Hard to tell by looking. You had to test the waters without drowning. Slip in gently for a bit of a dip. To be cautious then, she might have said, I will meet you beside London Bridge Station. And added no flourishes.